Welcome to The Dream Show. I'm Jane Theresa Anderson and this is episode 275-275. And during 2023, we've been departing from our usual podcast format to bring you the audio version of my most recent book, Bird of Paradise, subtitled Taming the Unconscious to Bring Your Dreams to Fruition. And today's episode is part 10 of the 10-part series. It's the last one. Each episode is standalone, but you will get maximum enjoyment if you begin with part one, which is episode 266. If you love the guest format, don't worry, it'll be back. And uh, now that we've delivered all 10 episodes of Bird of Paradise, and remember, in the meantime, you can go back through every single episode of The Dream Show all the way back to our first episode in 2009 and listen to my conversations with guests as we explore their dreams at janetheresa.com. That's Teresa without an H. Publishing the audio version of Bird of Paradise through the podcast means there's no fee for you, but if you'd like to express your appreciation and enjoyment, I'd like to encourage you to buy the paperback version for yourself or as a gift for a friend or two. Thank you. If you've missed the previous episodes of Bird of Paradise, here's a quote from the back cover to give you an idea of what's in store for you as you listen. Bird of Paradise is an inspirational guide to finding your calling and navigating your life using dreams, mysteries and alchemy. It's part whimsical memoir, part healing balm and part alchemical guide and it delivers my down-to-earth tools and techniques for decoding dreams and synchronicities as well as my unique signature alchemy practices that enable you to flow and grow with life's challenges, paradoxes and mysteries. So here we go, part 10, the final part of Bird of Paradise. And this chapter is called Mountain Time, Timus Precox. Even mountains flow. Even mountains flow. What does this mean to you? How do mountains flow in the physical world? Try to count the ways before reading on. We might think of mountains as solid, reliably static, defining features of our landscape. We might chip away at them, quarrying rock from them, building roads on them, blasting tunnels through them, but still think of the mountain itself as being firmly anchored holding its place. In the physical world, a mountain flows naturally on a grand scale when it's erupting volcano or rumbling and shifting during an earthquake or dissolving in torrential mudslide. On a smaller scale, it flows as it erodes, tumbling boulders and pebbles or fine particles of wind-blown, foot-trodden, rain-washed sand. It flows, shifts and changes over time. Over aeons, mountains grow, move, change shape and disappear. They flow across the planet, into and out of existence. A mountain flows with plant and animal life, with the changing seasons, with rivers and waterfalls, with melting ice, with new life after fire. It flows by sprouting grass and wildflowers around its edges and over man's digging, building, tunnelling and treading. It flows to reclaim, heal and find new ways of expressive being. Of course, you know that my writing is about our inner life and dreams, so you're probably already flowing way ahead of me. As you contemplate the apparently immovable flowing, as you count the ways in which even mountains flow, your inner world is responding to the suggestions offered by this metaphor. You may not yet be consciously aware of this process, or you may already be beginning to notice some feelings, urgings, and new ideas and perspectives popping into your mind where before 
there was resistance to change. Life is change, and change is life. There are many ways to go with the flow and to choose how to experience it, and there are many ways to observe the flow and decide on a change of course. Many of our dreams are metaphors for the way we handle life. If you dream of running from an overwhelming tsunami, ask yourself where in your life in the last couple of days that metaphor may be applicable. Are you feeling overwhelmed and trying to escape an inevitable deluge? If you dream of being confronted by a snarling wolf, where does that metaphor apply? If you can identify a metaphor in your dream and the parallel situation in your life, explore the dream metaphor further. Open it up and find ways of looking at it from different angles, lots of different solutions to the dream problem. Explore how you might tame the tsunami, fly above it, delve into it and ride it, or soothe it so it's calm. Perhaps promise to sit down and listen to what it has to say and work out a way to deal with it or surrender to it or heal it. It's, it's a metaphor, so none of this has to be logical. As you explore and work with a metaphor in this way, you are simultaneously exploring and working with a parallel situation in your life. Your perspectives will shift. New feelings will emerge, different approaches will occur to you, and new solutions will present themselves to you. You will notice that you begin to automatically respond to that particular situation in your life in better ways. This is a form of dream alchemy, and it can powerfully shift whatever is apparently immovable. Even mountains flow. So you can, too. The Folds of Time I hesitated to share this story (laughs) because it sounds implausible, but it did happen some 10 years ago, and the scientist in me has been trying to explain it away. So I entice you to don the hat of your choice. Dreamer, scientist, detective, alchemist, Skeptic, mystic, reader, and explore the following mystery. Three weeks ago, Michael's favourite hat disappeared. It was last remembered being worn at a picnic and was last seen in my car, but it was nowhere to be found. Michael and I each scoured my car twice, which was very easy to do since my car interior is quite zen. It typically contains a beach towel and a box used to transport any loose items in the trunk and an umbrella and one or two hats on the shelf behind the back seats. In the last three weeks, it had only contained one hat, which was mine, until Friday night. Arriving home, we opened the trunk to grab some bags from the box and, isn't that your hat, I asked Michael, as I reached out to lift it from the shelf behind the back seats? This was a strange question indeed, because it clearly was Michael's lost hat. But how could it possibly be just sitting there in full view when we had searched high and low for it, including this very spot? We were both speechless. It's a solid, structured hat, a trilby, not one of those hats you can fold or squash. It takes up a lot of space, and it was unharmed. I searched for explanations and I bet you're thinking of plenty now too. I have the only set of keys to the car which remains locked when not in use. No one was around to put the hat there when we weren't looking. Nor had Michael found and planted his hat there for me to discover. I got quite excited when I thought I'd worked it out. (laughs) Do you know how a magician pulls a rabbit from a seemingly empty hat? Remembering how it's done gave me a clue. My car is a five-door model, so when the trunk lid is lifted, the fifth door, the shelf behind the back seats swings up. 
Attached to the back shelf are two black folds of fabric that catch anything sitting on the back shelf. Quite clearly, I reasoned, Michael's hat had fallen into one of these folds of fabric about three weeks ago, only to somehow, by a quirk of mechanics and a sleight of hand, reappear from the folds and jump back onto the shelf on Friday. This was, no doubt, as foolproof and scientific as producing a white rabbit from a magician's top hat. So, I performed the experiment. But no, there was no way that the hat could fit into the folds of fabric without being damaged. The scorecard now read, Science nil, Mystery 1. Long ago, I learned to have fun with science to apply reasoning and logic, and then to let go and embrace the mystery. One way or another, Michael's hat had disappeared into the folds of time and reappeared three weeks later, and I'm here to tell the tale. Also consider this, the day before the hat's mystery reappearance from the folds of time, I found a fat envelope in our P.O. box addressed to both Michael and I. Opening the envelope, I saw cash peeping out between folds of paper. The sender explained that the money was payment for an invoice she had just found in a pile of stuff from five and a half years ago. This was money that she and we had long forgotten, now appearing from the folds of time. Waking life can be stranger than dreams, but if you look closely, you'll see recurring patterns in both. In dream analysis, these are called motifs. My waking life motif this week has been things appearing from the folds of time. Open your eyes. What's the recurring motif in your waking life now? Why might this be? The ghost in the lift. A few weeks before the mysterious disappearance and reappearance of Michael's hat from the folds of time, we were packing up to move from our inner city Brisbane apartment where we lived on the third floor of a four-storey complex. There were four apartments on each level and one central lift elevator. The lift was about three or four steps from our apartment door. One afternoon, on the way out, We saw the lift doors closing. Wait for us, Michael said, lunging toward it while I locked our apartment door. We both assumed the man had just got into the lift would hold it for us. We got there in time, walked into the lift, looked around, then looked at each other. There was no one in there but us. I didn't want to be the person to say it first. Did you see that guy get into the lift? Michael asked, slightly shaken. So it wasn't just me. Michael had seen him too. I know what he was wearing. Let's compare notes, I suggested. Again, I let Michael go first. It turned out that his impression of the man's clothing had been the same as mine. We pressed the button for the ground floor and descended in silence. I had already started to think that this was too weird a story to tell anyone. The scientist and me got to work. Might our neighbour to the right of the lift have gone into his apartment moments after exiting the lift? And further to this, had I somehow combined the two images of the lift door closing and the neighbour entering through the door of his apartment? It was possible. Perhaps it had been influenced by hearing the lift doors closing and expecting them to be closing behind someone who had just entered. But if this was what I had experienced, Michael would have had to experience it too. What is the likelihood that he and I would experience the same illusion at the same time? There had been two natural deaths in our small apartment block within the year, and my mind, wanting an explanation, wandered that avenue. Had we seen the ghost of a neighbour? The mystery remained unexplained, and when, within the month, we encountered the mystery of Michael's hat, 
I noted that these events, or illusions, occurred at a time of change and decision-making for us. We were exploring our options around where we wanted to live and how we wanted to integrate our businesses into our lifestyle. Symbolically, we had we somehow been presented with a, a sliding doors moment, an opportunity or parallel reality, step this way for one reality, step the other way for another. In one reality, Michael loses his hat, in another he doesn't. In one reality, we ride the lift with a neighbour, in another he is absent. I imagine we each experience a zillion sliding door moments and for some reason, ten years ago, we were more attuned to the mysteries of these folds of time. The three questions. I met two strangers at a party a year or so before I began to work in the field of dreams. This was almost 30 years ago now as I write. I say strangers because when I asked around afterwards, nobody else remembered seeing them. Both men who were a lot taller than me, and I'm quite tall, seemed to act in unison. We have three questions for you, one or both of them said. Who are you? They began. <laughs> this must be a trick question, I thought, because their intonation didn't come across as a friendly inquiry about my name. Well, I began tentatively, I'm me. They looked quite satisfied with my answer. What is the time? came the next question. This one seemed easy. The time is now, I replied, getting into the swing of it. After all these years, I cannot remember the third question or my answer, but I do remember them saying something about choosing me to bestow their gift. Then each one gave me a hug before promptly leaving the party as if their mission were done. I wasn't drunk or drugged or dreaming. I was totally conscious and aware, but I was slightly spooked. I became even more spooked when I asked around about who they were, but no one else seemed to have noticed them. I wondered what gift, if any, they had bestowed upon me, and I still wonder. My life experiences are so extraordinary at times, or my perceptions of them are, that I would be hard-pressed to distinguish where or how their intended benevolence might play out. There are years when I forget about them, and then at odd moments, like right now, when I sat down to write about something else entirely, <laughs> the memory returns, which is why I find myself sharing this story with you. Back then, after the party, I didn't look for the signs of the gift. Maybe, I told myself, there were just two men at a party playing a game, or maybe the gift and their ability to bestow it was an illusion they both held dear, or maybe they were drunk or stoned, or maybe they and the gift were for real. I just let it be. After all, I am me, the time is now, and although there is a third truth that would be nice to recall, I was happy to simply let all that be. Yet between that time and today, my journey into my personal dreams and my professional dream work has transformed everything. I am still me, the time is still now, but that the me is far more encompassing and the now is far richer and deeper than it was then. You have reached your destination. In November 2018, as previously mentioned, Michael and I moved into state from hot, humid, subtropical Brisbane in Queensland to cool, temperate Hobart in Tasmania. Tasmania is about as far south as you can get in Australia. After 24 years of living in Brisbane, this was a big change. Our plan was to look for somewhere to rent for the first two years, somewhere large enough for both of us to work from home. Oh, and we had a long list of other specific requirements, naturally. We knew that finding what we wanted might be a challenge as the rental market in Tasmania is extremely tough. Hobart is a popular tourist destination and many houses that used to be available as rentals are now fitted out as Airbnb accommodations for tourists. People shook their heads. 
Good luck with that, they said, somewhat mournfully. So we were prepared to do our best and follow the timing of the universe while living and working from a variety of Airbnbs. Why is it that you can magically create the card you need but not buy a house? Michael asked me one evening after we finished playing around the Quiddler, which is a fantastic word game if you haven't discovered it yet. I had just admitted that if I focused, I could draw the winning card I needed from the pile. Now, it doesn't always work, but it works so well most of the time that I actually have to try not to do it, otherwise I feel like I'm cheating. We had been searching for our rental for four weeks since our arrival, and while some houses had bits and pieces of what we were looking for, the totally right one hadn't yet turned up. Maybe Michael has a point, I thought. Have I lost my magic touch? There was a positive side to the experience. The whole house hunting and Airbnb hopping exercise was proving an opportunity over a few weeks to see a range of properties and suburbs and experience living and working in some of them. It was enabling us to extend and refine our search to get clearer on what we wanted. I really fancy having a red front door, I said to Michael one morning as we were out walking and mentally added it to my written list. The outcome of phase one of my story is predictable, so I'll hurry it along so we can proceed to the further unfolding of the story, one laced with mystery and synchronicity. A few days before my birthday in December 2018, we walked into a house that ticked all our boxes and signed the lease to take occupancy in January. In the end, our search had taken less than five weeks. It has a red front door. More than that, it has two red front doors, one each on a different story. Yes, of course it has everything on my original list. It's wonderfully located, even though we have been beginning to think we would need to live further out of the city to get the kind of house we were looking for. So now on to the mystery and synchronicity. When we had first visited Hobart for a short holiday in May 2018, I had felt at home the minute we stepped off the plane. We picked up a rental car, drove to our holiday Airbnb and found a nearby supermarket to stock up on food. We then had a quick and healthy bite to eat at a little cafe nearby. Evening was drawing in and we really wanted to move beyond organising practicalities and get into holiday mode. I was looking at the visitor's book in the Airbnb, I said to Michael, and someone wrote that the highlight of their trip was visiting Battery Point. Let's go and have a look. I hadn't done any research and pictured Battery Point as an historic artillery remnant. We drove round and round, our GPS insistently and annoyingly telling us that we had reached our destination. It finally dawned on me that Battery Point was a suburb, not a monument a beautiful suburb of historic interest and, as it turns out, once the site of a gun emplacement. By now it was beginning to get dark. We decided to head for the river shore, get some fresh sea air, go for a walk, but again we seemed to be driving in circles while being told we had reached our destination. Let's just randomly park the car and walk, I suggested to Michael. So we did then walked a minute or so and found a little beach and all the fresh and windy air and holiday inspiration we could possibly need. I could live here, I said, although it would be a few more weeks before we made the big decision to pack up and leave Brisbane and six months before we actually did. You've guessed it, haven't you? Where we parked the car that day was a few houses away from our future rental home. And for those of you who don't know Hobart, It is a small city of 220,000 people spread over a large area, so this was quite a feat. Had I manifested our home by saying I could live here that long ago in May before we had even decided to move from Brisbane? Or was our destination preordained as declared by our GPS? Had I lost my magic touch for our first four weeks of house hunting in November and December? Or did it just take time for the magic to happen and for the house I had imagined to come up? 
Or was there a grander plan according to which we needed to experience the alternatives and adjust to our new home state before the house became available? Curiously, the real estate agency that leased us the home is directly above the cafe where we ate our first Hobart meal near the supermarket back in May. We only discovered this after we saw the house. While we were house hunting, I was reading a novel, Unsheltered, by Barbara Kingsolver, that featured a woman who collaborated with Charles Darwin. Much of the story plays with the theme of science and God and whether faith and science can coexist. It turns out that the owner of our new rental home is studying theology. But that's not all. On the day we signed the lease, we moved into another Airbnb for the interim, and among the very few books on the bookshelf in that house was a copy of Charles Darwin's The Illustrated Origin of the Species. The last time I read The Origin of the Species, I was an undergraduate studying zoology at Glasgow University. It was in my final year there that I visited and fell in love with the Orkney Islands off the north coast of Scotland. When we first visited Hobart for the first time in May 2018 for a holiday, I very strongly felt much of the same magic and mystery there as I had in the Orkneys. Why do I mention this? At the same Airbnb, the coasters on the coffee table were Orkney souvenirs, each picturing different places in Orkney, places I had visited all those decades ago. I find that synchronicities run in bursts in my life, then quiet down for a period before returning. They are as important to me as dreams, and I revel in them. These synchronicities can take very simple forms. It may be that I notice that everyone who emails me in a day has a name beginning with the same letter. This happens so frequently that I often announce it as a J day or an S day. I struggled for years to make sense of this and finally decided the meaning was simply that there is a divine pattern operating in our lives whether or not we know how to read it. There is a divine pattern coming to light in this Hobart story. Somehow I have reached full circle. I have reached my destination and completed this book, all but for the story of the red flowers which awaits you in the next chapter. The final chapter, The Unexpected Harvest. The Red Flowers. I'm looking for volunteers to experience my life between lives regression so I can build my case studies for my certification, said Karen. And it begins with past life regression. Would you like to help me? I first noticed red flowers as Karen hypnotised me and slowly stepped me back through the years. You're age 11, she said. Look around. What do you see? Red flowers, fuchsia. I answered, examining Mum's basket of flowing fuchsia hanging at our porch door. I was up close to them and saw nothing else. I was thinking about how Mum had cut, pruned and trained them to flowering perfection. I have been hypnotised before and I'm familiar with the sensation of being conscious of the process, experiencing yet observing, thinking and reporting at the same time. I had forgotten about the fuchsia, so I was surprised that this memory should come up. It seemed insignificant. I was not immersed in the experience. It was as if someone was showing me photos I hadn't seen before, photos that were evoking lost memories. Karen took me through being a fetus, and then back in time through a long corridor and suggested I open a door. My dream life is lively and sensual and I totally believe in its reality while I'm in it. But when I opened that door with Karen guiding me in, the emotional impact of finding myself in a monastery garden took my breath and my speech away. Karen kept asking me questions I couldn't answer for quite a while. I cried. Yet the place where I was standing was beautiful. I was conscious of the hypnosis 
conscious that I was sitting in a chair in Karen's office in 2013, yet I was also in this other place. It was a place that felt numinous and real, and it had a deeper intensity than my deepest, most intense dreams. I don't know if I was experiencing a past life. If I looked at the experience as a dream and analysed it as a dream, it fit perfectly with what had been going on for me at the time. Did it feel more intense because I was conscious? I have experienced lucid dreams and I'd say the experience under hypnosis was more intense, more real. I was a monk, a man, in an Italian monastery in the 15th century. I was standing in a garden looking at a profusion of red flowers that had bloomed overnight and I was speechless with emotion. This had been my 20th year, my 20 year task, my discipline, my experiment to grow these red flowers. No one had expected them to bloom but there they were in all their crimson glory. I wanted to shout, to laugh, to cry, to celebrate, to gather the blooms in my arms and rejoice, but I was a monk and my duty was done. I was to be transferred to another monastery and assigned another task. I was to leave the fruits of my 20-year labour behind me for my brothers to continue the work. Karen suggested I visit a later part of this life and I found myself in Syracuse in Sicily in a turreted castle by the sea, sitting at a table outside, writing symbols in a book. I must have given up my robes, for I lived at the castle as a guest. I was fed and clothed in return for my wisdom and for helping people who came to consult me from miles around. One day, as I was writing, I saw ships approaching, heralding great change, a change that was not for me. I knew it was time to leave. Karen suggested I move to my final years and I found myself living in a grass hut by a wide flowing river on my deathbed. I had been living with the villagers here in what was a quiet life, I think. They were tending to me with great love and care. I was quite old and ready to leave my body. What is happening now, asked Karen. I was too choked with emotion to reply for a while. The villagers are reading to me. I taught them to read. What do you feel as you leave your body? Karen asked. Joy and pride that the villagers can read, I began, and I'm laughing because as a monk I should not be attached to pride. I'm letting it go. Was the experience a past life or was it like a dream? a dream I might otherwise have had while asleep, but that was encouraged during hypnosis. I told the story to friends and family, and the choke in my throat always came up at the end. I was never able to say, I taught the villagers to read, without my lips quivering, a flow of what had been held back tears. When I told this story to my son, singer-songwriter Ewan Gray, He transposed the male monk into a female and wrote a poem about it that I've included as the final chapter of this book. Whether it was a past life or a dream, pride and shame were childhood issues of mine. This being the case, perhaps it had taken a lifetime until now to figure out how to let go of attachment to how my being in this world is received. I once had a dream of a line of people serving food in a restaurant. The first person passed a plate to the next in the line, who spooned a serving of rice onto the plate and passed it to the next, who added a spoon of vegetables and so on until the last person in the line took the full plate and delivered it to the waking customer. What caught my eye was the very tall African man in the line-up who had to squat to be the same height as the others in the line. He swung his hips from side to side as he accepted the plate on his right, added his spoon of food and passed the plate to his left. I was sad for him in the dream because I knew his legs would ache from keeping up the squat 
instead of straightening his legs for comfort, lifting to his full and natural height. We serve best when we lift ourselves to our full and natural height, rather than stunting our offerings through misplaced shame, inappropriate humility or fear of repercussions of pride. We serve best when we reach deep into the roots of our being, beyond the self, drawing on the intertwined roots of billions of lives, in this time or another, this world or another. We serve best when we draw on that wisdom, those lessons, that karma, to grow and blossom, and to offer up a cornucopia of fruit and seeds, whether primrose, rose, honeysuckle, eyebright, heartsease, pear blossom, lotus, or any of the other flowers whose stories have been told in this book. We serve best when we do these things without any attachment to outcome. So I'm now going to read the poem that Ewan wrote for me and then stay there. After that, there's the epilogue to finish the book. Shavasana. In yoga, Shavasana, or corpse pose, is the final pose of practice. It's a time to lay on your mat, relax every part of your body and mind, and integrate any changes that have occurred during the session. I invite you to symbolically enter Shavasana as you read the final pages of this book. When I told the story of the red flowers in the last chapter to my son Ewan, he transposed the male monk into a female and captured the essence of the story beautifully in this poem. The Land of the Red Flowers Looking up above the monastery, bringing tears to my eyes, flowers, flowers, blooming red in winter when there should have been none. My tears make rings in the dust, ochre earth in a terracotta land. The sisters are rejoicing. It's a sign, they say, that our quiet peace will prevail. And the gentle breeze carries the news, flowers. I am alive with wonder, yet weary. My experiment took years, years of quiet, solitary study of the stubborn earth, the sun, of the mysterious life in the soil. These flowers, these crimson promises are alive because of me, my heartfelt offering to the world. Yet, back in my cell, in the early hours of the cloak of night, I'm torn with pride. Should a gift from the heart be mine to keep? Now, from my castle chamber, I watch the boats sailing out. Hopeful migrants to the home I left, the land of red flowers, a ruby promise across fields of sea. The king will be here soon, with these clutter of men, all hungry for wisdom, for secrets, knowledge, good fortune. I write relentlessly the symbols I see and can hardly leave my room for the goodwill and blessings I receive. A woman needs the comfort of a, a warm and pleasant home and my patrons are generous in return for all I've learned. Yet, when I wake before the servants, there's a cold wind in the corridor and my comfort is affronted by a certain shame the sense that my lingering pride is not quite appropriate for a woman of the cloth, for a woman who offers the wisdom of service and of letting go. So I straighten my clothes and banish my pride into the corners of the room and out toward the horizon. It was never mine to keep. But the symbols are changing and from the edges of the kingdom, change is sweeping across the foothills. The boats are returning, and it is no longer safe, even amongst kings and servants, for an old woman with nothing to keep. 
Now, when I have the strength, I can sit up and just make out, through the holes in the thatched roof, the castle on the hill. I can hear the river to my left, flowing, carrying all things elsewhere. The villagers are kind, and because my fingers can no longer grasp a quill, we talk, and the children always ask about the red flowers in winter. I tell them never to underestimate the power of the impossible, nor the potential of yourself, but also never to become attached to the fruits of your labour, for the gifts you give are never yours to keep. Yet my conflicted heart is feeble, and now when I let go of my pride, I'm out of breath and my life of service is flowing with the river out of sight, out to the ocean, and toward the land of the red flowers, where so many years ago I stood transfixed by my achievement, an achievement I couldn't own, but did, quietly and carefully, all my life, against the will of the world, and despite my best intentions. But I don't mind that I've led a life less pure than the one I'd wished for, than what others expected of me. I'm flowing with the river, and the villagers are reading to me, just as I taught them how, and their gentle words fall easily over me. They were never mine to keep. Ewan Gray Epilogue the stars that guide you home, bird of paradise. Once upon a star, many universes ago, the tide turned for the very last time. The ocean drew in upon itself, gathered up its deepest mysteries and rose into the air to the tune of a long exhale. Those who watched from afar in their dreams saw her magnificent translucence as she sang herself into new form, water into wing, feathers laced with pearl, a constellation of light sailing oh so gently through the oceanic night skies. She needs a name, they said, on waking and comparing notes about their shared dream. She needs a name so we can call to her. Bird of paradise, whispered the light to those who listened. In the ancient language, there had never been such a beautiful sound, a sound that danced the heart and gifted a lightness of being. In the most scientific of circles of our more recent world, and in the most romantic of hearts, she is called Starlight, a splendid vision of what once was, according to science, and what yet might be, according to romance. Fashions come and fashions go, and paradise, as a name, lost its appeal. Depending on your time and space, your language, your culture, your personal understanding of the nature of the universe, you may call her by another name. That name might dance your heart and gift you a lightness of being, or it might feel as empty and meaningless as a fiery death rose of a burning star of long ago. But on a dark, still night, listen closely, and you'll hear her calling, that bird, that flower, that seed, that story, that synchronicity, that dream, that mystery, that lightness of being, that interconnection with all that is. And whether you understand it or not, lean in, trust, flow, for the learning is in the journey and the stories you collect along the way are the stars that guide you home. And that's the end of my book, Bird of Paradise. 
So thank you for listening to part 10, the final part of Bird of Paradise. Remember, you can buy the paperback or digital version wherever you usually buy your books or look under Books on the menu on my website at janetheresa.com. That's Teresa without an H. janetheresa.com is also where you can go to discover my other books and courses as well as to consult me privately. And janetheresa.com is also where you can go to listen back through all previous episodes of The Dream Show. If you're keen to listen to guests exploring their dreams with me, go to episode 265 and work back from there. Thank you for listening to yet another episode of The Dream Show. I'll see you soon with another episode featuring guests having their dreams interpreted. I'm Jane Teresa Anderson.